Good evening. Good evening and welcome to this, the uh, April 10th meeting of the Livermore City Council. Uh, I now call the meeting to order. Uh, let the roll call show that all members of the City Council are present and accounted for. Uh, let me ask that you now rise and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <clears throat> okay, uh, question for the city attorney. Uh, was there any reportable action taken in the closed session? There's nothing to report. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, proclamations and presentations. Some of the fun stuff that we get to do is recognize some of the great things that are going on in the community. Uh, first one, uh, this is uh, uh, Jeff Schaefer from the city will be accepting this. This is the... Uh, uh, proclamation of the City of Livermore proclaiming Community Service Recognition Month, uh, April 2017. Uh, I know that we have the uh, uh, representatives from the Livermore Heritage Guild here, so uh, I hope I'm right. But uh, one of the things that I think was remarkable about this city is the community service is in our DNA. Uh, Robert Livermore, the city for whom this, uh, or the man for whom the city was named, uh, was known throughout the region for his generosity uh, and, uh, and and kindness. He would send his uh, riders out to find travelers, and if they were in need, he would encourage them to come back to his uh, to his rancho, and he would make sure that they had uh, provisions to carry on their journeys. So, uh, as I said. This uh, sense of community service and generosity uh, is in our DNA, and it continues to this day. So whereas Livermore has a strong tradition of community service and volunteering, and whereas Community Service Recognition Month is a time to celebrate the efforts of volunteers at the local, state, and national levels, and whereas Community Service Recognition Month highlights the difference that volunteers are making in our society, as well as the impact of their contributions toward those in need, Volunteers gain a greater understanding of how their actions affect the well-being of the public and often find that the giving of themselves results in the feeling of a greater sense of purpose and social connectivity. And whereas in Livermore, volunteers are the true heart and soul of the community. Over the past year, the city of Livermore benefited from the efforts of over 1,600 volunteers who donated over 48,000 hours cleaning up the arroyos and graffiti, providing uh, landscape enhancements at the Maintenance Service Center in Hanson Park, assisting the police department and library services, and providing general clerical and community service. And whereas April 22nd, 2017 is Community Service Day, where the city will be partnering with various community organizations and churches to coordinate projects around Livermore, such as maintenance projects at Livermore schools, local nonprofits, painting at Hageman Farm, and bark installation around the city. Now, therefore, the City Council of the City of Livermore thanks all of the hardworking volunteers and encourages residents of Livermore to volunteer to help bring about a positive change in the lives of others and in our community. Mr. Schaefer. Thank you, uh, Mayor Marchand and the City Council. I'd like to invite up a couple of the team members that we had. This year we've been meeting and planning for over five months for this event. Um, we're starting to approach uh, 700 people. Um, we have 20, I think 24 projects, uh, over 10 organizations. Um, and I'm just gonna talk briefly about little, just real quick about some of the city projects. You mentioned them at all, a little bit. We're gonna work at the maintenance center. We're gonna do some bark. One thing we're going to do is we're going to start, this will be the first year we're gonna plant a tree at the maintenance facility in honor of all the second graders as part of Arbor Day. And so we're going to do that. Um, and then hopefully that'll just be an annual tradition and that'll be something we've already went to the schools already and told them about it so we don't know if we'll have zero kids or 1200 kids show up <laughs> something like that but I'm gonna let them self introduce these people have been intricate they've been involved and I really think it's important that you as the council see their their great efforts great I'm Glenn Sherman I'm the assistant director of maintenance operations and facilities at the Livermore School District we have uh, 12 schools that will be involved in this community service day uh, doing projects such as painting, 
installing playground fiber in the playgrounds, uh, bark mulch, um, and general cleanup. And the timing is wonderful. Uh, most of you are aware, Livermore High School celebrates its 125th anniversary this year, so it'll be awesome to have all these volunteers there uh, cleaning up the site and getting that ready for that, that huge celebration. We also have at Junction uh, School, we have Comcast Cares uh, that will take place on the same day where Comcast really brings out a force. I think they're up to 150, 200 volunteers that will embark on that school and do a lot. So we are very much appreciative of all the volunteers that work hard in our schools. So thank you. I'm Jeff Kasky. I'm with the Livermore Heritage Guild. I'm the president of the Livermore Heritage Guild. And we operate the city's Hageman Ranch. It's a wonderful historic site, really a piece of Livermore's heritage. And you said right at the beginning that these volunteers make a difference. And truly, they do at the Hageman Ranch. Uh, it's a five-acre site. It's completely managed by volunteers. And to bring on a batch of volunteers like this to help paint, to help clean. Uh, I happen to know that some of the folks up there on the dais have been at uh, the ranch on previous volunteer days. And I want to say I really appreciate it. Uh, the ranch really appreciates what you do for the city of Livermore. And by the way, for visitors from outside the area who come out, uh, we already we are now open one, uh, one day a month. We are already getting visitors from around the Tri-Valley who want to come out and see Hegeman Ranch. Uh, so we're going to be doing this great cleanup and painting and things um, under the guidance of uh, Jeff and the volunteers that he brings along. And uh, then at the end of the month, on April 30th, we'll be opening the ranch for, again, one of our monthly last Sunday of the, mo uh, of the month open houses from 1 to 4. We'll have blacksmithing demonstrations. We'll give heritage tours around the site. And you get to come see what the volunteers have done. And you know, the question we occasionally get, and we hope that shows up again this time, is, hey, how can I volunteer? Michael Tree. Hi, I'm Michael Tree. I'm uh, with LAFTA, but I'm a Livermore resident. And uh, for the last couple of years, I've been working with Jeff on his committee for the Community Day of Service. And my specific duties are to reach out to the different congregations in the city to invite them to participate. So this year, uh, as with last year, we'll have about 14 congregations that are coming together on the 22nd to uh, do the various projects within the city. And uh, everyone's excited about it. Uh, some of these congregations have been giving service for over 10 years, and uh, it just seems to keep building. And so it's an exciting time. Uh, at 1501 Hillcrest, if you're out and about uh, doing service on the 22nd, stop by at noon. There'll be a community picnic there at the Arbor. So 1501 Hillcrest, and uh, should be a great time for all. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you. And, and just a plug, uh, we're still accepting volunteers. They can go to the city's website, and uh, they can look it up under the maintenance, or they can call 960-8017. We're happy to get more people. We will find jobs for them. Well, great. And if you're looking for a project, uh, there's a website called Just Serve. Dot org. So if you're busy on the 22nd and can't make it, uh, but you've got next Saturday or the Saturday after that, justserve.org is a fantastic website. If you've got people looking for a project or if you've got a project that you want to volunteer, uh, you can do both uh, on that website. It's a great, uh, great opportunity. Uh, Vice Mayor. Yeah, I wanted to thank Mr. Schaefer as well because I, I remember um, way back when it used to be that Earth Day was the big thing. And we would do a lot of projects uh, for Earth Day, and then that kind of scaled down. So I'm really glad to see that you started this up and kind of take place of, of you know, how massive that event used to be. So thank you very much for stepping forward and, and making sure that something's going on like this. Well, I appreciate that, and I definitely appreciate it on behalf of all the staff that are involved. So thank you very much. Thank you. Well, thank you. And it goes back to one of my favorite quotes of all time, uh, Rabindranath Tagore uh, said that I, uh, I, I slept and dreamt that life was joy. I awoke and saw that life was service. I acted, and behold, service was joy. I think that's something everybody needs to think about. So thank you very thank much. Thank you. April 22nd, Community Service Day. Next uh, proclamation, I have one, uh, and this is uh, our, our, a Donate Life Ambassador, Bob Moss. Uh, and this is a proclamation uh, proclaiming Donate Life Month, uh, also April 2017. Whereas organ, tissue, marrow, and blood donation are life-saving acts recognized worldwide 
as expressions of compassion to those in need. And whereas more than 100,000 individuals nationwide and more than 20,000 in California are currently on the National Organ Transplant Waiting List, and every 90 minutes one person dies while waiting due to the shortage of donated organs, and whereas a single individual's donation of the heart, lungs, liver, kidneys, pancreas, and small intestines can save up to eight lives, donation of tissue can save and heal the lives of up to 50 others, and a single blood donation can help three people in need. And whereas the spirit of giving and decision to donate are not restricted by age or medical condition, and to date, nearly 8 million Californians have signed up with the state-authorized Donate Life California Registry. And whereas Livermore residents can sign up with the Donate Life California Registry when applying for or renewing their driver's licenses or ID cards at the California Department of Motor Vehicles, now, therefore, the City Council of the City of Livermore proclaims April 2017 as Donate Life Month and thanks those residents who volunteer their time and donate to make a difference in the lives of others. And this uh, proclamation for Mr. Moss. of the Donor Network West and uh, my colleagues that are here with me this evening. We have uh, Janine, who is actually a living donor, my wonderful wife, Cheryl, that got me through my transplant, heart and kidney transplant, by the way. We have uh, Sonia, who is a kidney recipient, and we have Fred, who is a, also a heart and kidney recipient. I wanted to thank Mayor Marchand and members uh, of the council for helping us to bring awareness to the need for organ donors. Tonight, I am joined by my uh, volunteer colleagues. We devote thousands of hours every year to educate the public about transplants. Many of these hours are spent right here in Livermore, and we are all Livermore residents, uh, by the way, particularly at uh, both Livermore and Granada high schools, where we talk about uh, organ donation and uh, the need for reg registry to uh, high school students. Very rewarding program. Right now in Alameda County, there are over 1,400 people uh, on the waiting list. And uh, we encourage everybody to uh, certainly become organ donors, uh, not only at the DMV, but it can also be done online at donatelifecalifornia.org or on Facebook. Thank you and good evening. Thank you, Mr. Moss. <laughs> okay, now we're moving on to the uh, Citizens Forum. These are items that are typically very, uh, excuse me, uh, Citizens Forum, these uh, are, are for items that are not on the agenda. Uh, the uh, uh, City Council can neither deliberate nor take action on any of these items, uh, and I ask that you keep your uh, comments to three minutes or less. So we have Ann Call, uh, Mary Perner, and Nancy Saltzman. Hello, Mayor Marchand. Hello, Council. I'm here tonight as a committee member for the rally of love, Rally for Love, that was held in February. And I wanted to thank you, Mayor Marchand, for all the help you gave us in organizing that right from the very beginning and for speaking at our event. You gave a great beginning to the ceremonies that went on that, that day. And I, I know that the first time our committee came to see you, you told them that you did not want this to be a one-time thing that you would like to have some subsequent events. And that's what I'm here tonight to tell you about. The rally was such a great time for celebrating the rich diversity of our city of Livermore, as well as the Tri-Valley area. And as you all who were there saw, we, there were a number of information tables set up. And at one of those tables, people were invited to stop by and uh, they were given a little square of paper. They could write their 
family history of how they came to the United States, whether they were recent immigrants or their ancestors came or from a long time ago. And in reviewing the events of that day, we found out that 104 people had stopped by to fill out their information. And this so touched us and was such a heart heart-filled uh, thing, we thought, that this gave us the idea for our next event, which is going to occur on April 29th. And it's called Making My Way to the USA. Did you all get your flyers? You have flyers, good, yeah. good. I heard you guys like flyers, so. Um, this event is in recognition that all of us, whether in this or in previous generations, can trace our ancestry to other places. This will be held at the Muslim Community Center from 1 to 3 p.m. in uh, Pleasanton. And we'll provide a few speakers and then we're going to have small groups where people can share their stories with each other. There are going to be information tables uh, at the, the latter part of the, the time. And uh, people will provide immigration-related information. And there will be a, several specialists there who, can, who are is, experts in family history that can help people look for their personal family histories. So we invite everyone to come, whether you're a recent arrive, arrivee, recent person that came to our, uh, our area, or your family's been here a long time, but to support each other and share our, our histories of immigration. This is sponsored by the Interfaith Inter Interconnect Organization, the Muslim Community Center, and the Embracing Diversity Interfaith Group of Asbury United Methodist Church. Thank you very much. And thank you for your work on this. And uh, again, it was not, it was in hopes that it would not become uh, a single gesture, that it would be a, a change of mindset for the community. And uh, uh, thank you for your work and continuing that. You're very welcome. Thank you. We have Mary Perner and Nancy Saltzman. Good evening, Mayor Marchand and council members and members of the Livermore community. My name is Mary Perner. I've been here going on 30 years and I live about two blocks from here. As a member of the planning committee for the Livermore March for Science, I'm cordially, and you have the flyers there, I'm cordially inviting you and the community to attend and enjoy our upcoming event which will also be on Saturday, April 22nd, from 1 until 4, which means that if you're out there volunteering in the morning, you have a place to have fun in the afternoon. Um, we, um, let's see, we will be rallying at the Livermore High School Stadium, and I know that you're going to be there, Mayor Marchand, and hopefully the rest of you. Um, and. Uh, we, will, we will start with speakers, there will be a march through the neighborhoods, and then uh, we, it will culminate with a hands-on interactive science fair for children of all ages, even the big ones. <laughs> we are a nationally sanctioned um, march, one of more than 425 sister marches for science around the world. Our event is nonpartisan. Our overriding goal is to promote evidence-based science policy in our government and to encourage the public to become more actively aware and involved with STEM education, which is now uh, morphing into STEAM education. And whether that education is science-based through the preschool programs, joining a local science club, taking summer workshops at LARPD, and they have wonderful offerings, or whatever it is you choose to do, get yourself and your children involved with science and come celebrate and honor science at our March for Science on the 22nd. We hope you'll attend. Thank is there you. a website for more information? Uh, yes, there is. It's LivermoreMarchForScience.com. Okay. And as I uh, often and frequently have said, uh, science teaches us how to behave when we don't know the answer. It gives us those steps to get us there. 
Yes, it does. And also, uh, we take STEM education, uh, turn up the heat, add the arts, and we make steam. Exactly. Oh, I have a quote um, in, in conjunction with your quote, and it is, uh, let's see, service is the dues that we pay for our space on this earth. Yeah. Muhammad uh, Ali. Another good one. There we go. Thank you. Nancy Salzman. Good evening, Mayor, Council, staff. Um, I'm here just for to address three uh, issues. My name's Nancy Salzman. I live at 578 South K Street. And I would like to talk about that, uh, about medical marijuana dispensaries. I'm a pro proponent of establishing usable med medical marijuana dispensaries in Livermore and to assist the existing dispensaries to become fully viable businesses that will increase our tax base and assist patients receiving their medication when needed. The second concern is the increase in debris collections and a sewer fee. When did people start having to pay to go potty at home, pay more? Um, come on. Um, and the debris collection, 60%, that's just amazing to me. How much garbage can we generate? Um, lots less, I hope. The most important for my last and final and deeply felt concern is the divisiveness I feel that occurs in our community. I believe there are two opposing camps that disagree with each other about just about anything which involves more meetings, less progress, more delays, and increased expenditures. I'm absolutely sure all of the dissension comes from sources that devote a lot of time, caring, money, and I'm grateful for their leadership and willingness to make a difference. As the rest of our country is experiencing the same condition, I challenge Livermore to be an example of a cohesive town where people get along, listen to each other, respond respectfully, and put their personal desires for the city second to the needs of the community. Let us show the rest of our country what success really is. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Holtzman. Uh, that, that's the end of the cards for the uh, Citizens Forum. We are now moving on to the consent calendar. Uh, these are typically items of a routine nature passed with a single motion. Uh, is any council member, uh, do you wish to pull anything for comment? No? I do have a card for 4.03. Uh, so it's for Jean King. Ms. King? Jean King? Hi there. 4.03. We're moving the cal we're moving the calendar quickly, just just like we were asked. Moving moving items ahead without delay. <laughs> Sorry, I haven't seen her for a while. I've talked too much. Okay, Jean King, and what I'm here for is I was um, about the steering committee, and but you're also talking about. Um, later on in 6.03, you're talking about procedures. And so I just had a question um, about this. Uh, it says, it's actually you're gonna do it under 6.03, I think. But, but I, I'm concerned about it in relationship to the steering committee, which is an ad hoc committee. And so when I printed out the thing, it's on page 174, page 10, under 7.12, and they're talking about meetings that are not subject to the Brown Act. The Brown Act is a lot of work, <laughs> okay? And it says under 7.12, as provided by the Brown Act, meetings of an ad hoc committee formed by the city council shall not be subject to these rules of procedure. And I was just wanting you to look at that before you pass that. And that, because I, I presume that the steering committee is an ad hoc committee because it's going to be there for less than a year um, there. Okay, and then the other question I had about the steering committee was um, when they talked about 16.2D, um, where they're talking about um, the agenda, and I was worried about that I didn't get an agenda. I still didn't get an agenda, but I think they've got my wrong email address. Um, the, the, the staff liaison for the advisory council will make up the agenda, or as by directed by the city council. And I was just curious why that was in there, whether the city council was going to do the agenda. And um, I really hope that um, during all the steering committee, we'll have lots of workshops. So that's my only questions, and they're very disjointed. I direct that to the city attorney. 
<laughs> Certainly. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, with regard to the rules of procedure and what constitutes an ad hoc committee formed by the City Council, uh, as noted in your rules of procedure as proposed, section Government Code Section 54952 defines what is an ad hoc committee formed by the Council. That is a council consisting only of council members and less than a majority of your current body. So that would be two council members by themselves. If that committee is formed of less than a majority of the city council members but includes any other person that becomes a brown act body and that's set forth in that particular statute so that's why the downtown steering committee is subject to the brown act okay can i ask and the uh, the question about uh, the council setting the agendas i presume that would be at the direction of the council we could ask that specific uh, issues be considered by the uh, by the group you may and right now as I said in your rules in your um, confirming resolution the re the agendas for the downtown steering committee will be set by the chair who is council member Carling um, coordinating with staff in, you know, yeah, I wanted to ask a question too um, I've had uh, several people ask me about the um, about the administration of this and about communication with city council members and planning commissioners specifically and it, i don't know that we need to go into it here in gory detail but there seems to be confusion in there the way that's worded about um, to whom can people on the steering committee speak outside of, uh, of one of the steering committee meetings Certainly, I can at least give an introduction uh, as far as an answer to that particular question. Uh, the steering committee will receive a Brown Act training on Thursday as part of the first meeting. The admonition is because there's two council members who are on the, the steering committee. So if anybody from the steering committee were then to communicate with any other council member who is not part of that, that could potentially run afoul of the Brown Act. So we're trying to contain those conversations of the steering committee within the steering committee. Now, they can communicate with the council. That's by official act of the steering committee at an open notice meeting. They take an action, communicate up to the city council. The city council as a body would receive that communication at a formally noticed and agendized meeting as well. That's the way we need to have those communications occur to avoid inadvertently running into a Brown Act violation. Okay, I think it'd be important to spend some time on Thursday uh, with a about that again because again uh, I think the words that are written there led some people to conclude a slightly different interpretation than what you just provided and I have received com uh, comments okay. from the community as well and have responded to those okay. and our training will cover this and we'll actually okay. have diagrams as well <laughs> okay <laughs> pictures will be great yeah. yes sir. thanks so, okay so my, my uh, question I, it wasn't clear but I wonder if maybe in the procedures it could be a little bit clear that it's a ad hoc committee of just the council people or something something Okay, thank you very much. I'd like to say something. Sure. Yes. I, I, if you could just maybe elaborate on this, but you, you mentioned that the, um, King mentioned that the Brown Act is uh, painful, and it is, but let's think about what the point of it is. What's the spirit? And the spirit is that things get conducted in the open. There aren't to be side deals or side conversations. I mean, that's the spirit. So in my mind, it's absolutely worth it. And I'm very happy that there's a Brown Act. It's funny, you talk to folks from other states and they ask, well, how do you get anything done? Well, we get things done in full view of the public. Yeah, in the full view of the public, yeah, the uh, daylight. So of the I think that the, what's going to happen is we'll follow these rules. We'll be periodically reporting out what's going on, and everybody will get to know everything. I mean, that's the whole idea. Excellent points. One, one yeah, <laughs> sorry, one last thing. Sorry. It, it's the, uh, the consent that will never die here. Um, so under 6, um, Administration D, Communications with City Council Members and Planning Commissioners, um, it, it said that uh, steering committee members are expressly admonished that communications between committee members and members of the city council and planning commission are discouraged, blah, blah, blah. Um, but then also I, I recall reading something about that if a committee member has an issue, they are encouraged to talk to the chair who is a council member. So I, I just think that there should be some clarification and by adopting this now, are we locking into that? Um, because I, in one hand it's saying, you know, let, let's be clear, you know, it's saying don't speak to council members outside of the committee, which I, I do think is a, you know, exactly what uh, Council Member Warner was saying. I think it's, it's, it's a good idea. But then it, it's also saying direct all questions to the chair, who is a council member. So I, I don't know how you walk that, 
that line. Uh, maybe it's addressed later on, but are we locking ourselves in um, by, it, it does say uh, uh, admonished and discouraged. So it's it's not a thou shalt not, but. Correct, and as Council Member Warner uh, noted, the goal is to avoid a Brownick violation, whether right. in form or the appearance of that. We will cover that in the downtown steering committee. If there's a need to revisit these rules, we can re we can do that some future date. Okay. Uh, I think the training uh, will drive this point home a bit more clearly as far as where those lines are uh, currently exist. But again, as Councilmember Warner said, the Brown Act is not built for efficiency. It is a sunshine law to encourage public participation and trust and um, confidence in their government. Yeah. Okay. Mayor Marshall, while I do have the mic, just want to note for the record that item 4.06, you have a supplemental packet. The agenda itself, the resolution was not attached. We actually printed the staff report twice, but you now have the resolution. Okay, very good. Thank you. Uh, I also have two more cards on 4.03, uh, Jacob Schroeder and Jeff Kasky. Mr. Schroeder. Hi, good evening. I'm Jacob Schroeder. I'm a resident of Livermore, and I have some serious concerns about decisions regarding the downtown steering committee. In particular, I have concerns regarding how one is supposed to trust the outcome of the committee. Reason one regards the recent decision to exempt the committee from conflict of interest reporting and from the requirement that committee members be residents of Livermore. This committee will be making recommendations that will affect the bottom line of some of its members who have financial stakes in the downtown. Yet the council saw it fit to make us blind to these conflicts of interest. And additionally, I've seen no discussion of whether it is wise to make roughly 25% of this committee non-residents of Livermore um, who do not pay taxes to Livermore and will not be therefore financially on the hook if anything goes wrong with the downtown plan. Um, as an example, um, I saw uh, Joan and Lynn Seppala on the committee. They are both non-residents and they've contributed um, very large sums of money uh, politically in the town and to a PAC to support efforts to curb housing and development in the downtown and promote other types of construction. It stands to reason that the groups that nominated them could have easily found Livermore residents to serve on the committee who aren't saddled by these potential conflicts of interest, um, but I haven't seen any discussion on this. Um, my second reason for finding it difficult to um, trust the setup of the committee is I do not see it representing the diverse nature of the current Livermore. 17 of the 19 current members um, live in a relatively confined area between Kincannon and Tesla and First Street. Um, and the, taking, for instance, the region between the railroad tracks and 580 has no members on the steering committee. Um, in general, the demographics skew heavily older, white, and towards homeowners. Um, for instance, I, I see no one under 30 on the committee. I only saw two renters and no representatives of the Hispanic or Latino committee. So. I, I'm left with the question how I'm supposed to trust the outcome of the committee um, when it's had, in my opinion, important ethical requirements waived and when it seems like roughly half the population of the city does not have representation on the committee. So that's it. Okay, thank you, Mr. Schroeder. Uh, Mr. Spence, would you, I know that there was a concern that there was to get a large uh, representation of uh, um, various groups that had an interest in the downtown as we were making the selection of the groups. And there was quite a bit of discussion up here as to which groups were going to be represented. Right. So staff and the city council suggested uh, representative groups that have been active and, and participated in discussions surrounding the downtown. Ultimately, uh, for the most part, it was the groups themselves that selected the uh, participating representatives. So we do, with 19 members, we do have uh, a wide range of opinions. Um, it is hard to represent all of the interests in Livermore, but uh, tried to go through a pretty comprehensive process to uh, get a wide range of groups and allow them to self-select. For example, uh, LCAC, one of the member, one of the 20, 28, 30 members now, LCAC? 30. 30, yeah. Out of the 30 groups, one of them is the uh, uh, Hispanic Culture Center uh, is, is also representative of the group. So because of the large, expansive <coughs> representation for LCAC, uh, we do have Hispanics represented uh, on this because we've got 30 other organizations that are part of that group. So it's casting a very wide net, but I appreciate the concern. Uh, can, can I make just one comment? Is that uh, the, the purpose of this uh, steering committee is 
to figure out how to do outreach to the broader community. So yes, in fact, there will be you know, recommendations made by the committee. The final decision gets made by the council, and the point is how do we and, and how do we really truly get an understanding of what the community wants? That's the purpose. Good point. Uh, Jeff Kasky, one of the representatives. One of the representatives, indeed. Um, Mayor and Council, good evening. Jeff Kasky, uh, 585 <coughs> South K Street, but as chair of your uh, Historic Preservation Commission, one of the Council's advisory commissions, I'm also on this uh, steering committee. Um, I'm excited to uh, uh, be part of the committee. I wanted to uh, note that we're looking forward to creating the outreach, and in fact, I've started that as on my morning walk through downtown. One of the things that I've heard a lot of already is that people are interested in the possibility of the steering committee meetings being uh, video recorded. I, for one, I know I'm going to have trouble keeping notes throughout uh, our two hour, multiple two hour meetings, and um, other meetings have been video recorded, so I'd like to uh, suggest in any event that this be done. That might be one way also of allowing the public uh, to be a little less concerned that things are happening secretly behind their backs if they aren't able to uh, attend. Uh, we're looking forward to uh, that, that outreach. We're looking forward to the opportunity to figure out within the steering committee how to get to the public. We're really looking forward to the public workshop process and really involving the public when all the public can be involved, and I think that that's really the goal um, of the steering committee. Um, it was interesting uh, that it sounded like most or many of the members of the steering committee come from a large circle around downtown. Okay, that may not be such a such an odd group of people to have involved in the downtown. Also, some of the people mentioned who don't live directly within the city limits have been conducting a business here for 50 years. So I think that shows a certain amount of interest as well. Anyway, thank you very much, and really just wanted to stand up at this uh, consent item and say thank you. I'm looking forward to the process, and uh, we hope to bring this to the public. I think it's going to be great. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kasky. Okay, closing uh, with the uh, comments on the uh, consent calendar. Uh, is there a motion on the consent calendar? I'll move, it. <clears throat> move that we adopt it, we pass. Okay, moved by Councilmember uh, Coomber, Second. seconded by Councilmember Carling to uh, uh, pass the consent calendar. Uh, is there any discussion on the motion? All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Uh, any opposition or abstentions? Uh, passed unanimously. Uh, there are no public hearings, but uh, next matters for consideration. Uh, discussion and direction regarding BART to ACE update. Uh, we have uh, uh, Bob Binner, our assistant city engineer. Good evening, Mayor and members of the Council. I'm Bob Vinn, Assistant City Engineer. Uh, item 6.01, it will be a brief BART to ACE update. It will include some information on the status of the BART to Isabel Environmental Impact Report. Uh, briefly, uh, the status of the Isabel Neighborhood Plan, and the focus is really some work being done by the Altamont Regional Rail Working Group regarding uh, some state legislation and some uh, transit alternatives. So uh, the city is coordinating closely with BART, who is preparing a project level environmental impact report to extend BART uh, approximately five miles down the median of I-580 to a station just east of Isabel Avenue. There would be connecting bus services to destinations in Livermore. There would be uh, some ancillary facilities, uh, some power stations, wayside facilities, and tail track associated with the project. BART is also studying um, in addition to full BART technology, a, another rail technology called diesel multiple units, uh, which is uh, a diesel powered train, not electrified. And uh, they're also looking at two bus alternatives. So BART's been working on this about five years now, and they're uh, in the home stretch. They uh, expect to release uh, the EIR for public review uh, in the middle of this year with a decision by the BART board sometime by the end of this year. Um, after that decision, there's still some work to do. Uh, if they select a BART extension, uh, there's design, right of way acquisition, construction. So we could see a BART service running to Livermore in about the 2026 timeframe. 
Um, the city has been working on a land use plan around the proposed Isabel Avenue BART station. We call it the Isabel Neighborhood Plan. It's been developed over the last couple years through a, a visioning process, development of alternatives, which involved extensive public outreach and check-ins with the Planning Commission and City Council. And on uh, September 12, 2016, the City Council directed staff to proceed with completing a draft specific plan and a program level environmental impact report based on the draft preferred land use plan, which is shown here. So both the Barta uh, Isabel EIR and the Isabel Neighborhood Plan are expected to be completed by the end of this year. So the Altamont Regional Rail Working Group, we like to call it ARG, uh, it was created by LAFTA, uh, the LAFTA Board in uh, 2015. And their goal is to ensure that uh, rail planning in the Tri-Valley leads to project implementation that's fast, cost-effective, responsible, responsive to uh, local needs. Uh, you can see the membership here. It's made up of members on both sides of the Altamont Pass, and of course, City of Livermore is a member. So the, the ARG's done a, a number of different things over the last year, year and a half, but most recently, uh, they've been looking at legislation to create a new Tri-Valley, San Joaquin Valley Regional Rail Authority. So some uh, legislation was introduced um, back in March by Assembly Members Eggman and Baker that would uh, develop a, a rail authority. And uh, the Altamont Regional Rail Group is, is um, proposing some amendments to that bill. Um, this group, uh, or excuse me, the legislation would form the authority with a purpose to plan and deliver a cost-effective, responsive rail connection between BART and ACE in the Tri-Valley. That's really the goal of the legislation. Um, or, as it's proposed uh, now, uh, a new mega-regional rail connection between the Tri-Valley and San Joaquin County. So we want to uh, explore that concept a little bit more with the Council tonight. So there's two new rail alternatives that were proposed. One is a, a diesel multiple unit system that would extend from Dublin Pleasanton BART down the median of I-580 uh, all the way to Tracy and locations in San Joaquin County beyond. It, would, um, it could include a couple stations in Livermore. Um, right now the concept is to connect up with ACE out near Greenville Road, so the ACE connection would not be in Tracy, but it would be here in Livermore. And uh, of course, if we build the, the DMU in the median of I-580 from Dublin Pleasanton to the east, it would really preclude uh, an extension of BART technology to Isabel, which we just described where we're at in that process. Um, from let me go back. From uh, Livermore over to Tracy, the, it, the DMU is proposed to run along some old railroad right-of-way that the Alameda County currently owns. And uh, I'd like to um, point out there's an error in the staff report. Just real quick. On page 80. Last paragraph, it says that it would run in the former Western Pacific right-of-way. Um, that should read Southern Pacific right-of-way, and I'd like to th thank Bob Allen for pointing out that error for me. Um, there's also an alternative to run that same DMU from the Isabel BART station to Tracy and points beyond. Um, that would assume that BART's extended to Isabel, and this DMU would meet BART at that location. So um, that would preclude a further extension of BART technology to Greenville, if that's built. So um, the legislation that's introduced is called AB 758. Uh, the differences between what's introduced uh, what's been currently introduced and what the ARG group has uh, will be considering uh, at their next meeting, which is this Wednesday, 
Um, one difference is that the current bill includes 11 voting members instead of the nine that's currently on the ARG. It adds Stockton and Lathrop. A couple other key things is the current bill identifies the phase one extension as uh, BART technology to, to Isabel. Um, and the proposed amendments the ARG will be considering will have language allowing some flexibility on the technology. There's some additional uh, differences um, that you can see on the screen. Um, one thing that staff is recommending is that if uh, a technology other than BART is selected that uh, equivalent service should be provided to Livermore stations. Right now, uh, some of the concepts have the DMU running at uh, longer headways than BART, so uh, it wouldn't be the same as BART service. It, um, BART's currently running 15-minute peak and 30-minute off-peak headways, and there's talk uh, in the BART system to reduce the peak hour headways to 12 minutes. Um, we do have some information on the DMU alternatives. It's, it's clear that it's quite a bit cheaper on a per mile basis than uh, full BART technology, but there's a lot of information that we don't know yet, um, so further evaluation would be needed. Uh, ridership forecasting is a, a big one. Uh, what the costs would be if it were equivalent service in Livermore. Uh, there's some unknowns on the other side of the hill as to uh, what some of the right-of-way costs are, uh, and it might require uh, leasing track rights from the Union Pacific. Um, a, another big one is who's going to operate this railroad? Would it be an existing agency like ACE or LAFTA, or would it be the new authority or some other new agency? And where will they get the money to operate that? Uh, there's some concern about what the interface would be like at BART, whether it takes uh, additional freeway width, which have right-of-way impacts, or whether it would be uh, vertical on top of the BART station, which might create some visual impacts. And probably the biggest uh, unknown, at least from staff's perspective, is how the Livermore community feels about this alternative, because the staff has been out through all the outreach on the Isabel Neighborhood Plan, focusing on the extension of full BART technology to Isabel. Uh, we know the community supports that very well through citizen survey, through surveys on Isabel Neighborhood Plan, but we really haven't gotten a lot of input on DMU alternatives to date. Uh, I do want to point out there's a, a general plan policy that was uh, adopted with the Keep BART on I-580 initiative. Uh, it's shown on the board, and in order, if the city wanted to revise this policy, we would need to go out to a vote of the people to do that. And so tonight, we're seeking a discussion and direction from the council on the proposed language for AB 758, including proposed uh, amendments that the uh, ARG group will be discussing on Wednesday. Uh, we're looking for any direction from the council on the DMU alternative and how to, how and if, how and when to engage the community on it. And just as a reminder, the ARG is meeting uh, Wednesday at Lafta's office at uh, 2? 1.30. 1.30. That concludes staff's presentation, and we're available for questions. Questions at this point, uh, Councilmember Warner. Yeah, I've got one question on, just prompted by one of your uh, end comments there. The um, it's, it's even though we have a general plan policy to advocate for the um, part, I don't believe it precludes supporting this legislation, and even if the legislation is technology uh, agnostic. And so I'd like to ask the city attorney if that's true. That is correct. Can I uh, uh, make a comment on that? Um, I, I think by supporting this legislation, we are meeting that general plan policy. I, I would even call it that we're advocating with extreme prejudice uh, because we are taking over 
the construction of BART. Um, and, and I believe that when you advocate, um, it specifically says in the general plan policy, uh, advocate for a first stage, a stage extension of BART along I-580 freeway to a station at Isabel, that's exactly what this legislation is doing. Um, I think I'll stop there, because I, I think if I keep going, I'm, I'm not going to stop for another 10 minutes, so <laughs> I'll, I'll hold off uh, for comments from the audience. More questions, uh, Council Member? Yeah, uh, on your uh, slide on the proposed amendments, you say key differences. Could you help me? I don't understand what differences between what? It's the differences between the version of the bill that's currently been introduced and is going through this, the state legislative process. Mm -hmm. I think it's probably still in a committee. Mm -hmm. And uh, the version that will be discussed at the Altamont Regional Rail Working Group meeting on Wednesday. The, uh, it, um, the expectation is that whatever comes out of the Altamont Regional Rail Working Group as in respect to language for this bill will be sent to the bill's authors uh, with a request to amend the bill and incorporate those changes oh, in. Oh, I see. Okay. And on that same one, who's to decide what equivalent service is? Well, you know, we can talk about that, but uh, to me it means uh, the same headways, the same capacity, and the same speed. The good thing is, uh, you know, DMUs do operate at or above BART speeds, but they typically have less capacity per train, and if they don't have equip the, the same headways, matching headways, then, uh, you, you know, you'd have to wait twice as long, potentially, to catch a train. Sure, but you'd have to get off and get on. That is true. There so will that's, be a that's different. Yeah. I had another question. I thought, um, admittedly, I... I'm not an expert at reading legislation, but I thought AB 758 actually said that BART was to operate this. Because so, you questioned who was going to operate it and how it was going to be paid. And I thought I thought it said in there that that their expectation was that BART would operate it. Is that not right? So uh, there's um, language in the, the ARG version that says BART would operate it only if it's a BART technology or BART extension if it's this dmu project i don't think bart would operate that oh i thought well but okay. you're you are correct and, 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 yeah. and you're actually agreeing with each other um so <laughs> hey, good so, so what's going on is the bill as written yes. has that statement in it that's what i thought the okay. proposed changes to the bill would okay. change that point that's one of the key differences between okay. the bill as it exists okay. and what the regional rail group will be discussing on wednesday and right. that's one of the things okay thanks that that's what, one of the keys that we were trying to draw attention to good thank you very much that helps a lot and, and bart does in fact do they not are they not planning a dmu in east contra costa county right now they are going forward with that yes so i've seen the schematics i've seen have a bart uh emblem all over the side of the train too from what i've seen but i was more interested in promoting something with that's less polluting i guess that's the easy way if you drive 580 it's bad enough but it's it's so urgent that something gets start started just because we've as the staff report alludes to we've been talking about this since the 70s and uh, it doesn't it really to a cynic like myself it doesn't seem like we're all that much closer right now and that's uh I wonder if there is, you know, would the, the, the new language in the bill would enable a, another agency to form or be formed and uh, encourage the building of the, uh, the hookup with uh, San Joaquin County, if I'm reading this correctly. Because I would, uh, it's insane out there if you have to commute on 580 right now. Something has to be done about it. And we always say that huh? everybody in this room says that about just about everything in here. Got to do something about it. Well, this is just an opportunity to be supporting 758 that we may be able to come up with some alternatives and not have to rely on BART, um, as we've been speaking with them since the 70s, and uh, to, to make a decision at some point whether they're going to get here. So I have one more. Sorry. Uh, Councilman Warner. Oh, just one thing. I, yeah, I was noting, I, I didn't. Th somehow the thought of diesel doesn't strike me as a good thing i just think of more of these trucks or something so i th i think the uh, bill is agnostic on technology so 
electric is okay too, right? So I just want to make sure that there's, so I, I, I mean, it doesn't make any sense to me to make it diesel. I can't imagine the Sierra Club getting behind that. But the other thing I thought was interesting, we talked about equivalent service. I noted you didn't mention reliability. So hopefully that's not one of the criteria. <laughs> yeah, and uh, if I can add to on equivalent service, but also um, it has been discussed about um, instead of a DMU, they call it an EMU, which I often think of a smaller bird than a Small ostrich. ostrich. <laughs> um, but they do call them EMUs, um, and there are there are numbers, and and I don't know, you know, necessarily getting into the weeds about DMU versus EMU versus service. I mean, tonight is really about you know local control and and supporting, as Councilmember Warner said, this agnostic technology bill um, to to obtain local control. Um, and again, without snowballing here, because I'd like to hear from the, the public, um, be very careful about equivalent service, um, because I think in, in most instances, equivalent service is a pipe dream at best um, in terms of, uh, we've commented up here, I, I've heard it at meetings before, we talk about we're gonna fight for Bart Isabel, Bart Isabel, but you know, Bart Tavasco or Greenville, that's not gonna be in our lifetimes. You know, that's another three plus billion, four billion dollars, and there, you know, there's really no valid plan to take full BART dual track all the way out to, to Vasco. I mean the, the funding just isn't there. So I would I would caution using that term equivalent service because right now the equivalent service is zero. Uh, we we have nothing. So right now this legislation is a better chance of, of you know, uh, achieving uh, better than equivalent service than what we have right now. Uh, Councilor McCarley, you had another question? Yeah, uh, Mr. Venn, you mentioned buses, uh, but you didn't, that, at the beginning of your presentation, but then you, you didn't say any more about that. Is that, are they off the table, or what's what's going on? So um, in the BART to Isabel environmental impact report, they are looking at full BART, they're looking at DMUs, they're looking at EMUs, like Councilmember Spadowski mentioned, and they're looking at two bus alternatives. One they call express bus, bus rapid transit, which would be similar to uh, the rapid bus that we have now, except it would operate in the express lane on the freeway, and there would be direct ramps out of that express lane to a platform at the Dublin Pleasanton BART station. So it would save quite a bit of travel time over today where the bus has to merge over to the right, exit at Hacienda, and travel on surface streets to get to the BART station. The, uh, the other bus alternative is they're calling enhanced bus, and it's basically the service that uh, we have now with perhaps a, a little bit more. But LAFTA recently um, altered their uh, service plan and their routes, and they, they've actually implemented some of what the BART study was going to be recommending. Um, so it's up to the BART board when it goes before them to certify the EIR to select a project. And from what the BART board has said so far, um, some of them appear to uh, support bus alternatives. Some of them appear to support DMU alternatives. Um, it's, it's really not clear that, uh, you know, what alternative they're going to select, but there's you know, th there's controversy on the board uh, over extending full BART to Livermore. Thank you. Which is one of the reasons that ARG was originally formed was to create an entity that would build that project and ultimately connect BART to ACE. So I think that was one so of the... I got one of the questions you just mentioned. Is there any current <coughs> BART board member that's advocating BART to Isabel? Yes, Director McPartland. Uh, any other questions? Okay, I have a question. Uh, page 93, uh, the proposed version for discussion uh, at the meeting on Wednesday. The bill would require the authority's governing board to be composed of 12 representatives and would authorize the authority to appoint an executive. That's on page 93. Uh, on page 88, uh, it lists the members, uh, and I count 13, uh, and here it says uh, the current bill includes 11. So the, um, the bill that's shown on pages 84 through 92 is the current bill that's been introduced by Eggman and Baker. The bill that's, and that's called attachment two in your packet. 
Okay, and who is not, okay, so on page 88, who is not on that list that is on the list here? The, um, so on the attachment three, the 12 that you're looking at on page right. 93, page 93. Um, if you go to page 97, you'll see a listing of the 12 groups and includes the three ex officio business community uh, members. So the Innovation Tri-Valley, the um, San Joaquin Partnership, but it doesn't Bay have Bay Stockton Council. and Lathrop. It does not have Stockton okay, and Lathrop. Okay, that's the difference then. Okay, because when it, when it had proposed version for discussion at the meeting on April 12th, um, I wasn't sure which one was proposed for discussion. So it's, it's this one uh, after page 93. Okay. Okay, so that, that would not include Stockton and, uh, and Lathrop. But um, there, at, the, at this point in time, uh, they have not identified a funding stream uh, from the San Joaquin County. Not to my knowledge. <laughs> if you don't know about it, <laughs> then nobody does. Um, and this doesn't include, the, the DMU does not include, we're, so far the bids that we've seen for the DMU are for the, uh, uh, the cost per mile to build a DMU. Uh, does it also include the, the cost of the right of way? Uh, rolling stock uh, and the cost of operating uh, the system? So um, I don't recall seeing the operating costs. Um, I do believe it includes the right of way all the way and, over the, the rolling stock, but it was done um, not based on a very detailed level of, of engineering. So it, it is um, somewhat a rule of thumb cost, but they did look at certain elements in more detail. <laughs> Um, there's uh, like some grade separations uh, over the Altamont where it crosses over Altamont Pass Road. There was, um, you know, the interface at Greenville uh, with the ACE station. I, I think they did look a little bit closer at some of those things when they came up with their estimates. Do yeah, they looked at uh, creating another yard, uh, maintenance facility? Uh, were those costs included? Yes. Okay. All right. Very good. Thank you. Um, okay, I've got some speaker cards. Uh, Robert Allen, John Stein, and Andrew Liu. Mr. Allen, would you care to speak? You're on. I'm sorry, at the right, right page of 91, I don't hear what's going, what's <laughs> going cool. on. It's all good. I'd like to hear what you have to say. AB 758 proposes a new authority to pursue connecting BART to ACE. Far better, just extend BART beyond Green, the Greenville 580 station that's in the, in the uh, general plan, in the freeway median, onto the former SP roadbed, under westbound I-580, and onto an ACE intermodal near the high trestle or beyond. I put a sketch on the back of the uh, uh, copy I get, gave to you. The 2011 Keep BART on a 580 petition amended the general plan. It did not cover BART outside of the city limits. The petition predates construction of the hot lanes in the I-580 median. In addition to the route within the city, it affirms the plan line and the right-of-way preservation provisions of the general plan. BART trades require about 13 foot clearance above top of rail. That's uh, what they have in the subways in downtown San Francisco and Oakland. CPUC, California Public Utility Commission, General Order 26D requires a 22 and one half foot clearance above top of rail for standard gauge railroads. Has been doing that since I started to work for the Southern Pacific over 50 years ago. It appears that an AB 758 railroad in the freeway median would require raising the height of all freeway overcrossings by seven to eight feet, wow. an exceedingly costly and disruptive enterprise. Plan for BART tracks at BART gauge beyond Isabel per the initiative. 
and then along the former SP roadbed to an ACE intermodal and a yard uh, just, beyond, just east of the city limits. The planned authority is a severe mistake. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Allen. Uh, Mayor, I have a question. Yes. Um, and we also have LAFTA and ACE representatives in the audience, so please feel free to uh, pipe in uh, on this as well. Um, I, I don't think anybody is proposing a full ACE train down the median of 580. No. So that uh, Mr. Allen, um, and maybe Mr. Allen, I'll, I'll email you later because I, I have to scream into the microphone um, and I don't want to blow everybody's ears out, but uh, Mr. Allen? Uh, nobody is proposing a full ACE train down 580. So uh, what is proposed is, okay, I'll, I'll email you later, Mr. Allen, um, uh, summarizing the comments that I'm making here, but at, at no point have I heard that they're proposing the full ACE train that would require the raising of all of the, uh, the overpasses. Uh, a DMU, EMU, or even full BART option does not require that. Uh, of, of all the overpasses. So, uh, yeah, I see we have Mr. Levitt. Oh. Hi, Dan Levitt. I represent the um, ACE Rail Service. Just to clarify, uh, in our environmental document, which is coming out shortly, within a, about the next month, um, we are looking at a number of different options that go from the existing BART, Dublin, Pleasanton, out to Greenville. That includes BART extending to Greenville. It includes uh, DMU or EMU technology between the two. It also includes potential for ACE to to um, to actually come to either Isabel or to Dublin, uh, Pleasanton. Um, that's a part of our environmental document. It will not select any of these. Um, but so what Mr. Allen has mentioned for ACE is, is true that if ACE had come in, that we would have to raise but for the EMU or the DMU, that is not the case. So um, we are not promoting any of these options at this time. We're looking at them all equally, and then they'll be evaluated through the environmental process. Once we get it to the public, then our board will ultimately adopt some sort of a preferred. Great, thank you. Thank you for that clarification. Okay, John Stein, Andrew Liu, uh, Cindy Chin. Mr. Stein. Uh, John Stein, 1334 Kathy Court. Uh, it seems as though uh, this bill creates a, a new agency, which is a duplication, really. It would seem like it would be better to expand the ACE uh, purview to, to service this rather than creating an entirely new agency. Uh, they already represent San Joaquin and Alameda County and many of the cities that are part of this. Uh, the other question is funding. Uh, will the, if, if BART doesn't extend out to Isabel, will the $400 million in sales tax revenue that's being raised be, a bit, be available for these options? Uh, you've got to look at the money. I mean, uh, what BART has figured out is that studies are a lot cheaper than extending service. Um, there's no maintenance, uh, no workers, uh, no uh, pensions. Uh, uh, and we could do studies forever. I, when I came here in 1970, they said BART would be in Livermore in a few years. Uh, uh, the, some things have changed. Back then they had uh, uh, clean restrooms and working elevators and uh, lots of seats and parking and all of that has gone away, but BART still isn't in Livermore. Mm -hmm. uh, I think though that the underlying problem is that this is a failure of the one Bay Area plan. The plan is basically uh, that all of the industry and commercial development occur in the inner bay and all of the housing occur in Fairfield and uh, Lathrop and uh, Gilroy and even as far as Monterey. And what that means is you've got to have a lot of transit and a lot of uh, highways. Uh, they're building or planning to build a, a uh, 7 million square foot industrial and commercial development on the golf course next to the giant stadium and 1,300 housing units. That means 30,000 jobs and 1,300 housing units. In the same way, Apple is building a 16,000 employee campus with no housing. And uh, at some point, you've either got to disperse the commercial and industrial development or build a lot of high density housing in the inner bay, or we're just going to be chasing our tails for the next 50 years. Mm -hmm. A couple of specific comments. Uh, I probably won't live to see any of these happen, but perhaps bus service with tandem buses or articulated buses that could be gas, natural gas electric. 
uh, would meet a lot of the criteria and also offer a way of determining the uh, market, whether people will actually take it. I mean, if it's uh, 50 minutes from Tracy to uh, Isabel on uh, a DMU, diesel multi-unit, um, will people actually get on it? Because that means it's going to add another hour, and even with the traffic now, I don't think it's mostly, most days, it's not an hour from Tracy to Isabel. Uh, so overall, uh, um, I, I think that uh, uh, buses would offer an interim solution and, and at least be able to spend some of the money in the valley. Uh, there was also a statement that diesel multi-units could use the uh, UP trackage. I don't think you're allowed to run mixed diesel multi-units and freight trains. Uh, a locomotive would go through a diesel multi-unit like a bullet through tish tissue paper. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Stein. Andrew Liu, Cindy Chin, uh, Asa Strout. Good evening, Mayor uh, Marchant and uh, City Council members. Uh, thank you. Um, I've heard a lot of, uh, definitely, you know, a lot of positives to bringing in BART and ACE um, or other means of transportation to alleviate the congested traffic in Livermore. And definitely, you know, workers like myself, I can understand, you know, the benefit because it allows another means of transportation. Um, I'm a recent resident uh, of Livermore. I've been living here for a little bit over a year. Really love the city, and I know other people have been living here a lot longer. Um, I guess my concern is having this alternative means of transportation also opens up another avenue for possible criminal activity. Um, we don't have to look too far other than, I know the Stone Ridge Mall when the Dublin, the West uh, Dublin Pleasanton uh, BART station was opened a few years ago. And I understand that obviously that's not necessarily the sole cause of any uptick in crime, but again, it offers another um, avenue. Um, I guess my question to the council is, has that been considered uh, before we move forward, you know, with a final solution, and you know, if it has, you know, what what have what has the discussion been? You can finish your comments. Okay, uh, that that was pretty much my, my, my comments. Um, again, this is my first uh, council meeting, and I just kind of wanted to understand what um, you know as this discussion was progressing throughout the months and the years. Um, did the discussion of any type of criminal, you know, activity, things of that nature, those type of those type of negative. Um, you know, notes ever been discussed before moving forward with either approving BART or ACE or et cetera, other means of transportation. Okay, thank you, Mr. Liu. Right. Mr. City Manager, speak to that. So in answer to the specific question, uh, during the outreach process, uh, one of the things the council directed staff to do was to contact agencies um, that both had a long history of uh, BART in their communities, as well as those communities that had a fairly recent history, um, comparing before and after projects. Um, what study, uh, so our police department and our police chief met with uh, chiefs uh, uh, from a couple of different cities on that and, and uh, came up with uh, conclusions that generally followed this, that generally BART stations um, reflect the environment which they are in. Um, so if you are in an extremely dangerous neighborhood, your BART station tends to reflect that. If you're in an extremely safe or affluent area, generally the BART station reflects that. The newer stations generally have better and more security. Um, they are very well monitored with video. Um, generally, BART makes a pretty terrible getaway car. Um, it's a very defined location. Um, it runs on set schedule, and you're sort of a captive audience once you're inside the train. So from that perspective, um, cases of people traveling to a community, getting off a BART train, taking an Uber somewhere, going downtown, committing a crime, taking an Uber back to BART, getting on BART and leaving the community. Um, it's just not a terribly effective thing, and that's not what the stats pointed out. However, what does happen is BART has large parking lots, and so what happened is those large parking lots looked a lot like other large parking lots in the communities that they were at. Um, so the, the actual cars in the parking lot were sometimes um, targeted 
um, there. But the instances of essentially a dramatic uptick in, in crime in the communities where BART started service, um, that wasn't borne out by the statistics. However, this is an issue that the community has noted um, repeatedly. It is something we continue to study, um, and we'll be basically making sure that ultimately, if there is a project, uh, whatever the technology is out there, that the station is designed in a way and that BART uh, and our uh, local law enforcement agencies interface work very well to minimize those sorts of impacts to the community. Thank you. Uh, Cindy Chin, uh, Asa Strout, uh, and Michael Tree. Good evening, I'm Cindy Chin. I'm with Assemblywoman Catherine Baker's office. Thank you, Mayor and Council Members. I do have a brief statement to read on behalf of Assemblywoman Baker um, regarding the BART legislation. Um, the proposed BART legislation is the number one way we can set a connection of BART to ACE and the extension of BART is by taking it off BART's already full plate. A dedicated local agency that focus, focuses solely on studying what is best is the best way to connect them. Livermore was the inspiration for this legislation, and again for Assemblywoman Baker's bipartisan legislation this year. As you know, the bill does not pick a DMU all or alternative. It just gets an agency set up to get the project done more efficiently and effectively than BART will ever be able to do. Assemblymember Baker would like to thank the mayor and all of the council members, city manager Roberts, and all of the Livermore city staff for helping us draft this legislation with Livermore as a priority. The assemblywoman is completely dedicated to protecting the interests for this community and BART to ACE. Thank you. Thank you, and best regards to the uh, assemblywoman. Certainly appreciate her support in our community. Uh, Asa Strout and Michael Tree. Hi, my name is Asa Strout, a uh, longtime resident of Livermore as well. Uh, thank you for your time. Um, just uh, wanted to start by saying that I agree with uh, Councilman Coomber and uh, Councilman uh, Warner in that it, we should have it be an electric plan only because we've already lost Caltrain's electrification budget and so we should not continue to build you know, outdated technology rail that you know, has been around for 50 years we should be pushing forward. Um, to jump to my main concern about BART is to give a little context for me is, you know, my grandfather moved here when, when he was starting his family. He built his house in Livermore. <coughs> Excuse me. And um, my mom and uncle still live in Livermore. And I recently decided to, you know, to be, have Livermore be the place where I raised my family and just bought a house in September for my newborn who was just born in February. Um, and Congratulations. Since, thank you. Um, and since then, you know, I think that anything that doesn't involve BART getting to Isabel and to Greenville um, is an embarrassment, not on the sake of Livermore, but on the sake of BART's mismanagement. Um, to add on top of that, you know, we've been paying a 0.5% sales tax since the 70s, since the, the system was actually built, so like late 60s, like 68-ish, 67. Um, and since 1997, Livermore itself, through that 0.5% sales tax, has um, paid BART over $150 million. Um, when I looked into it, I got the number of 165 million, and the Tri Valley itself is upwards of 474 million. I would have more data, but that's the only records that are digitized. I'd have to go to the archive at Cal State Hayward to get more info on that. And I've run the numbers for a lot of other cities too. This actually is the main contention for me. If we don't have BART out to Livermore, it's kind of a, a it just sends that tax money that we've been spending since the 70s is a complete waste. That's why I think it's an embarrassment. We should be pushing BART to really get it going. Um, um, to speed things up with my last minute, um, that's actually one of the questions I had was, is there anything that Livermore can do to speed that up um, besides, you know, um, alternate things? I, you know, I really think it should be the single rail train because getting off and going on, I mean, I worked in San Francisco and I was commuting from Vasco. It, it, you know, it's terrible. The, the Dublin and Pleasant station is bad enough as is. Having to go from one station on Greenville, exiting, and then getting back onto that station as a commuter is an absolute nightmare. And today now I commute to San Mateo. So now I, I basically 580 is, you know, my best friend. I hang out with them every day. Um, the fast well, track, right? Yes, fast track. I do have a partially electric vehicle, so I'm able to ride that um, lane. So that's, that's the godsend. Um, my last point. Um, 
would be, I don't to disagree with Council Mender, I'm going to pronounce your last name. It's Stadowski. Um, I don't think local control should be the goal. You know, I think that we should be thinking, you know, someone mentioned the one um, Bay Area initiative, which is keeping all of our communities together. Um, when we have cities fighting for control, we start to lose a little bit and cities start to fight and then nothing gets done instead of kind of surrendering a little bit of control for the greater good. In this case, you know, a BART system that would be throughout the entire Bay Area. And that includes Santa Clara and San Mateo actually paying that 0.5% sales tax, which they don't do today. But that's another point. And thank you. Thank you, Mr. Stroud. And one of the reasons to form the Osmont Regional Rail Working Group, uh, which we're ultimately going to rename, uh, was to do just that, to take the project uh, from BART, as uh, Ms. Chin pointed out, because BART's got a pretty full plate running an, organ, uh, an agency, uh, is take it off the plate and create an agency whose sole job was to complete that BART uh, connection to Livermore. Uh, with that, uh, Michael Tree. Good evening, good evening, Mayor, and... Uh, uh -oh. That's okay, start over again. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much for your comments. <laughs> I, uh, you know, I, I'm glad to be here. Glad that you're talking about this topic. Uh, I think, from the perspective of the the working group, and certainly from staff to the working group, which is LAFTA, um, I think it's important to know that what's currently AB 758 is currently a spot bill, and um, what's going to be worked on and proposed and consensus gained on. Uh, in the working group meeting on Wednesday is the amendment to AB 758. And so as I think about uh, what's most important from my perspective that you know about tonight, it's that it's the moment. It's the moment to basically take control of a project that's been floundering for 40 years, where millions, 10 to 15 million dollars has been spent on environmental work. It's being planned literally to death. Mm -hmm. And this is the moment to stand up as other communities have and say that we're going to take local control of the project and we're going to get this project done. It's been done in other areas of the United States where large uh, rail operators have been unwilling to provide an extension. It's been done cheaper. It's been done quicker. And this is your moment to say that what's really important about AB 758 is not technology because there is no technology outlined in AB 758. What's important that you know about is that it gives uh, power to an authority to be legit and to move that project. I, uh, I, I've been to BART meetings and I've been to listen to BART directors outside of those meetings in a public setting. And this BART board has no intentions of building you BART to Livermore. And so it's time to take that project and bring it into a sole focus agency that can get that done. That's really the issue tonight, and it's the issue that the working group will be working on jointly with the other cities and policymakers in the Tri Valley. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Tree. It's the last of the cards that I have, and I will. Uh, echo what uh, Mr. Tree was, was speaking about. Uh, I was at a Bay Area Council meeting recently, and Bay Area Council is, is behind a BART extension in Livermore, absolutely. Uh, but what was disturbing at the meeting, or at this this uh, uh, meeting of the uh, the agency, was the uh, the comments from the mayors of the major cities in the in the uh, in the Bay Area, uh, San Francisco, San Jose, and Oakland, uh, and all of them agreeing that there should be no new BART extensions. Uh, that what they want is to spend the money on another shaft across the bay and uh but we've been paying into to, uh, uh the operations of bart for years and what we're trying to do now is to get the capital funds to bring bart to livermore and to make that connection uh, to get the traffic off of 580 uh, and that's why we have been working so hard with the other tri-valley cities to get some political will behind this. And we certainly appreciate uh, Council Member Baker, uh, Council, uh, S S Senator Steve Glazer, and uh, uh, even uh, Congressman Eric Swalwell that have embraced this concept of making this uh, BART to ACE connection. And that's one of the reasons that we, we've been working so hard on this. Uh, 
question I forgot to ask before. The uh, you mentioned the uh, the Isabel neighborhood plan, uh, and part of that is is to meet the uh, uh, resolution thirty four thirty four from the MTC about. Uh, uh, the residency requirement, the number of housing units. Are there housing units, what's the level of housing units required if a uh, DMU, EMU comes in? Or do we just throw out the whole thing and start over again? Well, there's, uh, MTC does have a requirement for housing around uh, BART and DMU right. and Express Bus for that matter. They're all different levels. Um, this was a number I was supposed to have for this meeting, and I don't. I believe it's around 2,500 units as okay. opposed to 3,850 for full right. BART. But I can get back to you with the exact number. That's right. I know 3,850 is the is the BART number, and I think yeah, the, the DMU is somewhere around 2,500. But, yes, yeah, so those are the numbers. It's ballpark, but it's less. I just wonder if we have to go back to the, the drawing board to start all over again uh, if we start re reworking this plan. One of the concerns that I have is the, the language that, you know, on, on one of the proposals to add two more San Joaquin cities, uh, uh, Stockton and Lathrop, uh, and at the same time transferring the money into the authority, when right now all of the money is from Alameda County and there's no identified sources of funding uh, for San Joaquin County, yet we'd be increasing the representation in San Joaquin but they're not bringing any money to the table, but they would be voting on how those dollars would be spent. So with that in mind, I like the uh, the membership of the, the working group as, as listed on page 97. Can I uh, uh, comment on that, Mayor? Sure. Um, yeah, the legislation proposes the makeup, but we, we would still need to develop bylaws and I, I would assume, and, and let me make sure that this is clear, at, at no point did anybody ever say that Alameda County money would be spent in San Joaquin. Uh, there, there's just, and, and I, I'm not saying that you're implying that as well, but I wanted to be very clear on that because I, I've heard some confusion and a, a lot of the money that's been generated, it, it legally can't be spent outside the jurisdiction. So um, I think that um, getting into that level of detail with the legislation, I think it's more appropriate for the bylaws. And I think in the bylaws, it should be stated you know, just for the record, that any money generated within a jurisdiction would be spent within that jurisdiction. Uh, at the same time, we could craft the bylaws to say that any projects within a jurisdiction would be voted on the members of the jurisdiction itself. So you don't have um, that uh, crossover of Alameda County telling San Joaquin what to do and San Joaquin telling Alameda County what to do. Um, it, it would be, um, you know, we're, we're there for overall coordination and how to connect. But at the same time, you're still retaining that control uh, within your jurisdiction. So I think that that would be an appropriate place to talk about it in the bylaws rather than the, uh, the, the legislation that's being formed. So what's your position on the membership? Uh, I, I believe that uh, Stockton and Lathrop should be uh, represented on the board because uh, my, my general feeling is that we need to make that connection to San Joaquin County. Uh, if, if we build BART to Isabel and stop, we just built a five-mile extension uh, that would relieve congestion on a five-mile segment of the freeway. Um, and, and what you would have then is you have an end-of-the-line station at Isabel that will experience the exact same levels of parking problems that Dublin and Pleasanton experience right now. Uh, you would have it probably filled to capacity by seven or eight in the morning uh, and side streets over parked. So to me, um, that's why we need this this critical connection with San Joaquin County. We need them riding on a system to get them off of 580 uh, in its entirety. Uh, whether that's a direct connection at, in Dublin, or we do build BART uh, to Isabel and then have a more integrated station there at Isabel for whatever uh, whatever comes about. I, I don't know. These are still, I mean, there, there are a lot of questions. Mm -hmm. That's why getting into the, the DMU um, uh, discussion tonight, I think, is a, is a major distraction from the overall goal. And I also think that, you know, uh, as a preference, um, you know, in, including ACE's presentation here on DMU without ACE presenting it, um, I, I think if you're to attach it to a staff report, especially this type of presentation, 
I've seen it multiple times. I know the mayor's seen it at least once, but we have three council members that have never um, looked at this presentation before, and it's kind of hard to see all the details on a minimized slide in a staff report. So um, I, I think eventually down the road, it would be great to have ACE present that whole presentation. There's a lot of context that's missed uh, by putting it in the staff report. But overall, I, I don't have a problem with the makeup of, of the board um, as will you know, probably be proposed tomorrow. Uh, because we we do need those players. We need we need people off of 580 throughout the entire corridor, and and not just uh, stopping it at Isabel and calling it a day. One of the concerns that I have on that, however, is that we do represent the city of Livermore, and as Mr. Strout pointed out, Livermore has paid hundreds of millions of dollars into the operations of the BART system. Uh, I don't see the benefit of having trains DMUs starting in Stockton and then hitting the Alameda County border full and then just driving through Livermore uh, and making the connection into Pleasanton which would then provide no benefit to the citizens of Livermore and yet they will have been continuing to pay for a system that they're not going to benefit from. Sure, and I, I think that that definitely needs to be addressed. There needs to be ridership models and also estimates as to uh, because, you know, I, I heard something different about DMU, EMU units, that they actually can they ha can have a higher capacity than BART trains. Um, I, I don't know if that was in one of the, um, the, the presentations, but um, it, there, there is, again, there are many questions. Uh, I think another viable alternative is having that BART station at Isabel, and you could have Livermore residents park there and then get on while the people from over the hill make the transfer. Uh, also, if you did have the transfer going through town, uh, the, the, the status of the parking right now in Dublin and Pleasanton, I think people would park at Isabel, stand on a train for five minutes, you're now standing and you're the first to get off that train and get a seat on BART in Dublin. You know, you're, you're beating the San Joaquin people to the punch. So this is the details that I think we need to discuss. Well, let me, let me I, I ride BART most days and you, even if you get on at Dublin, you're not the first on this seat because people are riding from coming from the west going east to get on so <clears throat> forget coming from the east so no you can't so the what I would suggest though is just as you said this talking about the details is just kind of irrelevant tonight and and not helpful because <clears throat> where I'm coming from I agree with Mr. Tree there's one BART board member that advocates for BART to live out to Isabel no others in fact not, in fact they're against it so I don't think it's ever going to happen with the current board I don't think a future board would ever vote to extend full BART to Isabel so I think the only other and I've been around here now 40 more than 40 years so I've been right in the middle of it I don't think if I were to live another 40 or 50 years it would ever happen frankly so I think that this legislation is a chance for us to get, I don't know if it's local control or something, but it's a chance for us to get some service that we are not ever going to get otherwise. So I think if we get into a debate about the particulars at this stage, we're going to do ourselves a tremendous disservice because all we'll do is not get the legislation passed. And it's our only hope to actually get anything out here. So I would suggest we don't talk about it. The uh, you know the staff asked for uh, discuss DMU alternatives. I think that's just irrelevant. Why don't we get the legislation passed and then tee it up? And there's plenty of time. So I, I think just forget it and do whatever is best to get the legislation passed, and then we'll deal with it. But if we get into our own little battle about this, we're going nowhere. And that's exactly what. Bart would like to have happen because then we could join them in studying this stuff, right, and talking and doing nothing. So, I say get the legislation passed and let's then let's get going. But let's not, de you know, score ourselves up by worrying about things that don't matter at this point. And this being a spot bill, it can it can be reamended as it moves ahead. Sure, and so let this let's just get the ability to start something because we know now. That the alternative, depending on the BART board, we're going to get nothing. Right. Is there any way to hold uh, sure. BART accountable? I mean, this is their job, right? I mean, uh, well, it's the operated transit system. <laughs> that's why the VTA, the Valley Transit Authority, built the extension 
going into San, San Jose uh -huh. is because BART wasn't going to build it. Sure. So they got money from the feds, they got money from the state, and they created this agency to build it, and they're handing it over to BART for the operations. So that's what the attempt is here with the Altamont Reg Regional Rail Working Group is to create an agency whose sole task is to make that, that BART connection deliver more. And that's why we need state legislation to do that. Yeah. I just, um, I mean, Ms. Chen talked about taking it off BART's plate. I, I don't even think it's on their plate, is it? <laughs> well, no, and, and no, that's, just being, that's just being polite. And the, the way I've always described it to people is that, you know, Lucy's pulled the football from us too many times, and Livermore is collectively tired of laying on our backs, staring up to the air and saying, good grief. Yeah. But I recall, that's, that's exactly what's happening. I recall, I mean, this reminds me of a colleague of mine that years ago, he was just furious at the, his assistant for screwing up his travel, so he decided he was never going to ask her to do it again. And I thought, well, that's, she got exactly what she wanted. <laughs> so isn't Bard, I mean, just by Bard ignoring us, isn't, and if we form another agency, isn't that what they're, we're just playing into their hands, aren't we? No, we'd be taking, this would be legislatively taking the no, responsibility like, away from them sure, the funding. Sure, a responsibility for which they're shirking. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. But yeah. this, and, this and, is the way we get it done. And, and they're proud of it. And this yeah. is the way All right, that's my right. point. So but the thing is, I mean, that's very important. There is no leverage that we have over BART through the current board. We will never, ever get the votes. Yeah, I'm sure that's true. Right? I mean, just look at them. They allow BART strikes. They're the highest paid. They've got terrible service. Yeah. Incredible uh, reliability issues. They, you know, they, they can't even keep their escalators and elevators running. Right, they much less a train, right? So they are not particularly good, and they don't care. Yeah, right. And there's nothing, no leverage that we've got other than this legislation. And I've, I've, I worked with Bart as a transit planner for four years on the West Dublin Pleasanton station, and one of the recent questions that I had for Bart staff: Do you engage in the de in the uh, design build process? Uh, that's a very common tool that's used where you use one company to design and build your project. It could shave years off of the time and also save a lot of money. They couldn't answer that. And then I asked them, have you ever engaged in the design build process? And it's no. And the reason why I asked that question, my experience with West Dublin Pleasanton, they engage in the design, 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 more design, and then delayed build process. I mean, you can see Warm Springs. That's a perfect example right now. Um, one of the things that I, I, I did is I started watching the BART board, mem uh, board meetings online because uh, I, I wanted to see the comments for myself. And if you look at, I think it's either the first or second meeting in February when they were discussing the parking station uh, in, in uh, the, the parking garage, I should say, in Dublin. Now, mind you, they have 7,000, over 7,000 Dublin and Pleasanton residents waiting for two or 300 reserved parking spaces. So they have a 7,000 person waiting list and they voted on a promised and planned uh, parking garage to delay another 90 days on making that decision so they can contact Oracle and other local businesses to see if they can share parking lots. And, uh, and to give you uh, an idea, even our Tri-Valley representative voted for that delay. So it, it's, it's at that same meeting, um, one BART board member stated that, flat out said, BART will never be built, built to Vasco ever, just flat out said it. Another one stated that, you know, a bus service could provide equivalent service to BART. If you did a, and, and as a former transit planner, the number of buses you would need to run, and again, you think a, a transfer on a direct rail connection is, is, is not convenient. Think about then waiting for buses with traffic along 580. And mind you, they're thinking, oh, they could take the, uh, the uh, express lane over into the, the, the station or build the direct on-ramps. Well, taking the express lane, try merging a 40-foot bus over five lanes, driving five miles and merging another five lanes. Not going to happen. Mm -hmm. But what was really disturbing, um, one of the, um, and I believe one of the more influential BART board members uh, stated that he has a preference for revisiting the station expansion policy prior to deciding on the Livermore extension. So what does that tell you? Um, he said the policy hasn't been updated since the 90s. I don't think that policy is going to become more lenient. I don't think they're going to make it easier on us. They're going to make it even harder. And when we um, initially reviewed the Isabel Station plan, the council did have comments. Hey, who you know is the tail wagging the dog on this one? Are we building this density just to 
meet BART's demands, or you know, can we scale it back? And, and you know, there there might be some interest in scaling that back. So I I really you know I wholeheartedly believe that they have no intention whatsoever in building BART out to Livermore. It's just it's it's over. It's done. We're generating roughly five million a year in sales tax. You know, so that that goes to the operations of of BART. And I think it's Mr. Um, now now I have a, a chance to not pronounce your name correctly. Is it Asa? Asa. Plan 2040 for the Bay Area, which outlines the regional rail connections, doesn't even have a dashed line going out to Livermore. In in the next day, they don't even have the courtesy for our five million a year to give us a dashed line anymore. At least we get that on the maps inside the BART trains. When I'm riding, I could sit there and think, oh yeah, someday. So it, it's just it's to the point where uh, I agree. You know, let's not get in the weeds because I could talk DMU, ZMU's full BART. The reason why the BART, you know, uh, uh, gauge is so large and how much right of way. We just it's it's time. And from my understanding, that if we don't support this and if it does not pass, there is probably not a third chance. You're not going to find a legislator that will take up an item that has failed twice already. And the first time it failed, I think it's it's extremely unfortunate. I think it was because of Assemblymember Baker being a Republican. And it was just killed at the state legislature just because of that. So I don't think there's a third chance on this. And quite honestly, you know, reading through, we just passed our 2017 state and federal legislative agenda. Uh, this matches many of the items um, relating to regional and local transportation and also uh, supporting uh, our, our, our goals for local control. So I think this should be part of our legislative agenda as well. That's it. Yeah, I just, just to wrap it up, I wanted to just make sure it was clear that, and I knew we would stray from the question, which is to support or not support AB 758, which I support completely. Um, it is in flux. It is probably in, in committee, I believe. Uh, but it provides options that BART hasn't provided us over the, well, as the staff report says, since the 70s, we've been talking to BART. And we're still, I don't know if we're still talking to them, quite honestly. I, I, I hear nothing from them. And I've just, we've done everything that BART has asked that we should have here in Livermore to enable a BART station to be put in here. And they keep getting farther and farther away from us. And uh, I, I think AB 758 pro provides some alternatives, which, just to put in context, getting up at 4.30 every morning to take my wife to the ACE train in an hour, I get to watch the uh, Channel 2 News early on and see all the red lines coming out of Tracy over the Altamont into Livermore, uh, over 84 to, to 680, and uh, fortunately don't get to drive in them because of the ACE train. I know there's a need um, to build ridership models. shouldn't be very hard. I, I'm sure that stuff like that can progress fairly quickly because uh, both not only from the Stockton side of it, but south, you know, which I believe ACE is exploring right now, going to the south down towards uh, Crow's Landing, Patterson, the, the, the Highway 33 corridor. Uh, but I, I just think enough. We, I, I'm tired of it. I've seen it when I, before I moved to Livermore 27 years ago. Um, and I came out here and watched the, the city decide whether, well, was it going to go downtown or on the freeway, but not a word from BART. And that was ultimately the what people were failing to recognize that no matter what the city decided it's up to BART it's not up to us so we therefore need to explore alternatives and AB 50, 758 provides that for us so I certainly support it okay so it's like we've got a uh, pretty wide-ranging consensus here to support uh, 758 so do we need a formal motion on this or just uh, direction no, the direction is fine. Obviously, uh, the council is aware that they have two voting members on the ARG, but won't be ARG very much longer. That'll probably be the last time we can say that in an open meeting here. I love that. Um, it'll have a much so. more bureaucratic name soon. Um, and so from that perspective, uh, if the two voting members, bluntly, have their direction for uh, Wednesday's meeting, uh, then I think your staff understands sort of where we are in the process. And so I have one other thought. Is I really don't think it's worth spending much, if any, staff time talking about 
EMUs, DMUs, let's get the legislation passed and then think about it? Because I don't think, you know, I, I just don't want to waste money. Okay. okay. See you on Wednesday. Okay. Um, let's see. We are... This is, next is uh, norms and uh, values established at our meeting on January 26th, our workshop. Thank you one and all for your comments. Mr. Wilson, uh, with regards to uh, uh, Supervisor Haggerty, thank you for uh, representing his office here tonight. Appreciate it. Norms and values. Good evening, Honorable Mayor. Members of the City Council, I'm Christine Rodriguez, your assistant to the City Manager. Um, back in January, Council held a workshop to review existing norms and values. And as you recall, norms and values are the foundational piece of how Council interacts with each other and with staff. Um, staff received feedback at the January workshop, your feedback, and incorporated that into a red line version of the norms and values, which is attached in your staff report this evening. Should the council decide that feedback was accurately recorded, um, staff recommends you adopt the uh, resolution attached this evening. And staff's avail available for any questions you may have. Questions? One question I had is on page 127. It just seemed a sort of an awkward phraseology. Uh, top of the page, the background information that informs the policy. Um, is that a legal convention? Uh, I was thinking that the background information that supports the policy. Page 127. The red line version. Top. Second line. Oh, we can change. We can change that. That works. I mean, I, I, I don't know if it's a legal term, but it's a, to inform the policy. It sounds like we're telling the policy something as opposed to supporting the policy or that was the background information that supported that. The concept we were trying to capture there, which we didn't do very effectively, was the discussion around the background information necessary for you to ultimately create the policy. Right, I got um, that. that. That was what we were trying to say. It didn't quite get there, but supports works. Okay. Um, Wait, just, uh, there's a nuance there. I, that's why I, I didn't object to the inform. Okay. Because it, there, otherwise, if you say supports, it's kind of circular. Okay. Because, right, because you'd have to know what the policy decision was in order to support it. But this whole thing is to get the information to allow it to be developed, right? Whether well, it provides the information to create the policy? It, it, well, it's just, it, I, I mean, I've, maybe I haven't used the words right, but I, in the world I've been in, the inform is, is okay here. Just because it doesn't mean define and it doesn't support because you don't know what it is before. It just, it provides information upon which is, and it doesn't even uh, uh, decide the policy. It's just there for uh, input. It's just input to, to the provide policy. the background information. It's just, it's just input policy. to the policy, and that's why. You just seem an awkward. I, I know, I know what you mean, but you don't want to make it support or anything else, but it really is whatever you want to say, but it's just input. So how would you phrase that? I would say inform, but. <laughs> <laughs> Background information to create the policy. How about that? Okay. Yeah, go, go with whatever, but it, it okay. really that, is. Does that, does that work? Great. That, that, uh, yeah, the, in, the inform is kind of an archaic grammatic reference. It's not, it's not modern English. It used to be used pretty substantially 100 years ago. But uh, nervous used to be not strong. so much anymore. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Both, both you and I were around then, I guess. <laughs> exactly. I'm a chemist. This isn't the language. I still have my use. textbooks. <laughs> Any idea where, where we're going on this? You're going with creates instead of okay. informs or supports. The information that um, creates the policy. That creates the policy. Okay, I'm good with that. Okay. Uh, is there uh, well it's actually informed the council members who are right and that's what it is i'll move approval of the uh to adopt the resolution yes okay. i'll second moved by the vice mayor seconded by council member coomber any discussion on the motion all in favor uh, aye any opposed or abstentions passed unanimously
Okay, next we go to the uh, uh, rules of procedure. Yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, Jason, I'll call your city attorney. Again, hearkening back to your workshop back in January, you also considered your city council rules of procedure. Uh, what you have before you today is a culmination of that. Again, we have a red line version of those rules that you considered back in January. Um, but there are three different items to that. One is the city council meeting rules of procedure. The second are the procedures for your teleconference meetings, actually incorporating and setting forth that policy officially. And the third is your preferred method for recording. Um, these rules were last updated in March 20, uh, 2006. Um, these are your rules for your conduct of your meetings, but they also do touch on certain administrative matters. Just to highlight a couple of items that we had from the changes um, back in January. The preferred method of recording reflects your current practice, and the method depends upon the type of meeting and locations, but you're always able to direct otherwise. Uh, it also now incorporates a sergeant at arms at your pleasure. <laughs> Uh, the citizens' rights have been consolidated into Section 11. Um, it speaks to how the public should address you, and it also acknowledges that you're in a position to receive public criticism. Um, the updates also include uh, Section on Disruptive Speech that is now consistent in, uh, with the current law, and also ad adopts the most recent change in law that says if speakers are using a translator at the podium, they're entitled to twice the allotted time. Um, the, the changes also deal with abstentions and how to vote in uh, break tie votes. Um, gives direction to your advisory bodies. Currently, you had Robert's Rules of Orders in their various rules of procedure. We're directing them to now follow Rosenberg's, which are much more streamlined. And also asking them to conform to your rules. Uh, lastly, it also contains a section uh, with regard to your expectations for brown eye compliance. Um, you were very prophetic back in January talking about how to use electronic devices in advance of the San Jose versus Smith decision. That has been incorporated into your rules of procedure as, long, as well as a direction to staff to return with a formal policy for you to consider relative to the utilization of electronic devices. Uh, with that, I'm available for questions. Questions? Uh, as I as I read these uh, read through these, I ran across a uh, something that I have not been doing. Um, it says that the mayor shall state uh, all motions, and one of the things that I relied upon is the uh, city clerk to keep track of the the wording of those uh, those motions. Uh, so is that? still permissible or uh... it is by practice it is the, the role of the mayor but it's also sufficient if someone says i'm moving staff's recommendation that's the way your staff reports have been organized and your agendas to allow you to do that and occasionally we will have someone that will make a, a fairly we've had a few fairly convoluted motions up here uh, and i've relied upon the city clerk to be able to keep track of all the the wording on that as it continues to be crafted and, and that's what we're here for. Right. Yeah, and generally, okay. we do as staff try and read that back to you all so that all the people who are being asked to vote on the motion have an understanding. Because um, it's, it's uh, and indeed, we, we have tried to do that. But ultimately, it's at the direction of the presiding officer. Your, your staff is reacting, essentially, Honorable Mayor, to your direction when you're calling for the question. And, and occasionally, you do actually say something like, can you please summarize, you know, what we've actually now got on the floor? Okay, very good. So that, that's... So you uh, are doing it. We're helping you with that. Point. Okay, I appreciate that. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, so any other questions on this? Is there a motion to accept? I'll move to accept. Moved by Councilmember Carling. I'll, I'll second. Seconded by uh, uh, Councilmember Warner. Um, any, uh, any discussion on the motion? Uh, all in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Uh, any opposition or abstentions? It passes unanimously. Thank you. Okay, moving on to uh, uh, committee reports and uh, matters initiated. So uh, let's go to Councilmember Coomber. Well, let's start. Let's see. I guess the last committee report was last Monday when we met, the LAFTA board met. Uh, and the highlights of which were also discussed here tonight as we discussed the le legislative agenda uh, and uh, to what's going on in Sacramento and beyond. Is there a beyond? I guess so. Um, and I won't go through a item by item about, about how we felt about uh, AB 758, but we were roughly in accord with this council's uh, talk about that. As for items initiated, matters initiated, I wanted to mention that 
things you see while driving around town, and that's very dangerous pedestrian crossings that you're already aware of, I'm sure, at several intersections, which are probably too numerous to mention now, but um, Murrieta and Stanley uh, particularly was one that got my attention as I saw people fly around the corner in a big truck while people were in the crosswalk. Um, East Avenue, anytime there's a, a school morning and school kids are crossing at East and, uh, oh, not Hillcrest, next one down. Um, next one west but uh, there's a crossing guard that we're lucky she's alive at this point from the way people are steaming down East Avenue so just uh, a matter of wanting to bring that to the attention I'm sure it's at everybody's attention high traffic times of day people are in a hurry to get somewhere just please slow down and we don't need any more bicycles or pedestrians here in town anymore but it may be something we want to look at it. as speeds seem to increase not by us changing the statute, but de facto, they are increasing uh, on some of our larger tributaries, and we need to maybe come up with a strategic plan for dealing with that. Easy for me to say. I don't have a helmet and a motorcycle and a badge anymore, but uh, you know, it's really the simplest answer. But uh. right, Councilmember Carling. Yes, uh, on the uh, 29th of March, I participated with. Mayor Marchand at the Tri-Valley Group Innovation Awards, and he may say more about that. But it's an opportunity to recognize some of the uh, entrepreneurial work that's going on in the Tri-Valley. I think it's quite impressive, uh, the kind of technologies that are being developed, not just technology, so uh, some of them uh, are, are uh, a group up in, uh, maybe it was San Ramon, that's got a a spot where people can come and work in a more collective and cooperative way. And there's also another organization that's providing um, particularly Girl Scouts with uh, experience in technology. So it was quite a mix of, uh, of awards that were presented to uh, some really uh, clever ideas and innovative approaches to, uh, to um, developing uh, technology and uh, jobs here in the Tri-Valley, so. Yeah, that was, that was a great event. Uh, Councilmember Warner. See, one of the uh, things I attended was the uh, Livermore Cultural Arts Council monthly uh, meeting, and it was uh, interesting in, the, in the one, one area in particular was people are beginning to continue to formulate the Arts Career Center, and one of the uh, presentations was a person from the, uh, from the local college and went through the uh, curriculum that was, you know, pertinent. And I, I actually, uh, I found all the opportunities there quite exciting. So I was thinking, you know, maybe I should retire and take some classes. And then I said I didn't want to do homework, but then they said I could audit. So, but it was, uh, uh, it would, but it was, it was very interesting. So I would just encourage people to check out what's what's at the local college, and as we go through that, the other thing uh, we did, and I would like to have it have it mentioned, is that um, Councilmember Carling and I got together with the staff, and we. I sort of did some preliminary brainstorming about what the um, steering committee had, uh, topics could be and in what order. And so I uh, just wanted to say is I think we want to get on a regular reporting out basis here of, of what it transpires so the full council can do it. So in, the, in that spirit, I just want to um, mention that, that what we came up with, just looking at what the committee could um, uh, managed to get done in a meeting, and we got a couple of meetings a month. But just real quick, you know, so 413, we have the uh, kickoff meeting where we introduce ourselves, we learn the, about the Brown Act, and just begin to understand what's what. But the real, um, the next meeting, the suggestion is that we focus on the uh, on parking and traffic studies, so that we gather the facts around that as what's known. Then another meeting after that, we could focus on the hotel parameters and what, what's uh, pertinent. And then um, we go from, uh, from the, the next meeting <clears throat> could be on getting additional input from others who have uh, some kind of stakeholder or interest in the downtown. Then uh, we could, by that time, maybe get a report from the uh, financial uh, subcommittee that we've got going and talk about the financials, and we'd have a chance to jointly go there. 
then um, by having gathered all of that information, we could uh, begin to then get into the details on how to do community outreach. And then uh, after that, get into the details on the retail, the commercial housing open space needs. But you can see that <clears throat> the idea that we've come up with so far is focus each meeting on a particular meaty topic and and get it uh, covered as best we can. And once you do that, given the number of topics, it's going to uh, extend over several um, meetings. But the idea is that we'll have the meetings, we'll find out what is uh, thought about at those meetings, and then we'll be able to report out here and um, get check-in from the full council to make sure we're in the right direction and have people have you know opportunities to also uh, weigh in. But that would be the, the thinking. Good, very good. Vice Mayor Spadowski. Sure, thank you. Uh, speaking of the Finance Committee, uh, we did have our uh, kind of an initial kickoff uh, with Councilmember Coomer, myself, and staff um, just to go over uh, expectations for the committee and also some of the um, preliminary background on how we acquired what properties downtown and, and what are some of the liabilities associated with each property. So I think a, a report out would be a, a good idea. Um, once your committee is, is ready to receive that kind of information. I just don't know how we do that, um, but we'll have to talk about that at, a, at another point in time. Um, I've had several uh, lab to committee meetings uh, recently, uh, either board of directors or the operations committee. Um, other than what Council Member Coomer already stated, um, we have been tweaking our, um, our service alignments. Um, over the past, I think it's about six months now, we've had the major changes in service, so we're doing uh, slight tweaks to routes to encourage a, additional ridership and efficiencies there. Um, so that's that's one of the things to report out. But uh, also there is the Go Dublin pilot program, uh, which is the partnership with Uber, Lyft, and taxi cab companies for areas of Dublin that used to be, um, that were previously served by uh, lav to routes but had horrendous riderships. So we should be getting a report on the success uh, of that uh, shortly. And then other than that, I had uh, one uh, Tri-Valley Transportation Committee Finance Subcommittee meeting, um, and that was uh, largely focused around just our um, uh, kind of our, our banking uh, rules and procedures, because we recently, um, I'll bore people here, but we recently switched over to LAIF, uh, which is a, a type of uh, city government investment account. And so we are um, establishing rules as to how much we should keep in LAIF versus how much we need for operating. So. All that fun stuff that you know you read late at night to get to sleep quickly. So, uh, other than that, I don't have any matters. Uh, March 29th was the Youth in Government Day, and it's always a fun thing because we get uh, about 20, 25 youth in here that are actually interested in uh, public service and government. Uh, so they went through a, a mock city council meeting, uh, and I had. Uh, uh, the person that was shadowing me, we went to the Game Changers that uh, Councilmember Carling mentioned, uh, and I got, we got to recognize two Livermore companies, Wiley X, uh, which has had their sunglasses uh, featured on the cover of Newsweek and Time Magazine and also an American Sniper uh, in the movie. These are military-grade uh, sunglasses that are made right here in Livermore. Uh, and uh, the, the technology behind these things are amazing. They uh, uh, take a, bull, uh, a ball bearing and fire it into every batch of, uh, of glasses, every, every uh, one that they test, uh, 600 feet per, per second, uh, and it holds up. They uh, take a one-pound spike, drop it from six feet into the glasses, uh, and they hold up. These things have saved... Uh, a lot of uh, military uh, and, and police personnel's uh, eyes. So it's, uh, they're, they're phenomenal glasses. So they're recognized as a game changer. Uh, also a uh, medical procedure company called Sandstone Diagnostics uh, was also recommended uh, for an award. Uh, last year, POC Technologies, uh, the POC, medical, POC Medical Systems uh, was recognized. And on March 30th, we had a ribbon cutting uh, as they moved into their new facilities here in Livermore. They were also fledged out of our iGate program uh, using technologies licensed from Sandia and Lawrence Livermore. Uh, there was also a special LAVMA meeting uh, where we went through the uh, uh, executive director's report and the operations report. And today was the ACTC I-580 committee update. Uh, the uh, the ridership is, is pretty much consistent around 
uh, 30,000 uh, cars per month. Uh, this year, it raised, or so, so far, the income is $6 million year to date on the express lanes. Uh, and any money that is over the cost of operating the lane uh, stays in that corridor to support local transit. Uh, also, uh, uh, on the uh, legislative planning and policy meeting, uh, the new transportation tax, uh, SB1, uh, was passed. That's a $52 billion package over the next 10 years. Uh, $24.4 billion is going to be raised from raising the gas tax 12, uh, 12 cents. Diesel excise tax raised 20 cents. That'll raise $7.3 billion. Uh, and also a new vehicle registration fee, uh, $100 per vehicle uh, for uh, electric vehicles. And... Um, Let's see, included in that is increased funding for Livermore. Uh, Livermore, the baseline is $1.68 million. The increase estimated for fiscal year 1819 is going to be an additional $1.6 million, so a combined total to Livermore of $3.3 million a year uh, to support uh, local roads uh, and uh, transit here in Livermore. So uh, that was a good thing. Uh, so with that, um, there being no more business to the uh, council, uh, meeting is adjourned. <laughs>